all good. I want to see like a bunch of yeses in the chat just so I know that you are all with me. Uh, this might get annoying, but I, I do want to make sure that we're all together. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, let's start. Um, so this is going to be two lectures. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is ingestion of food. Then we're going to move on to swallowing. So for ingestion of food, uh, we're going to talk about two centers. So the food intake center, the thirst center, and then we're going to go into detail on the salivary glands, how is saliva produced, where it's produced, and what it's made of and how we regulate the secretion and all of that. That's mainly like the bulk of the of this session. So I have my contact details here. Uh, text me on WhatsApp anytime. If you want to email me, that's fine too. If you want me to if you don't get something in this lecture or anything else, uh, I will be happy to help anytime. Okay, bismillah, yeah. Okay, so we have a part of the brain known as the hypothalamus, right? And in this hypothalamus, we have the food intake center. So this center basically determines whether we feel hungry, whether we feel full, whether we feel the need to eat something and whether we don't want to. Right? And it all depends on what part of the center is stimulated. So if something stimulates the feeding center, it would cause increased levels of hunger. Right? And if something stimulates the satiety center, and satiety means uh, the feeling of being full or not being hungry. So if something stimulates satiety, then you wouldn't want to eat. You would feel less hungry. And this is exactly what these terms are talking about. So stimulation of the feeding center causes hyperphagia. Now, phagia means to eat, and hyper means something that's increasing. So it's an increased need to eat or increased hunger. And then the opposite would happen if we have destruction to the feeding center, you would have hypophagia, which is decreased tendency to eat. And then the same thing for satiety. If we stimulate satiety, you would have less, you'd feel less hungry. So that's called hypophagia. And then if you destroy the satiety center, if you have destruction to the satiety center, then you would have increased feelings of hunger because nothing is telling you, uh, you know, that you're full. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Um, there are a few more terms. Uh, I, I can, sure, I can repeat. Which, would everything, or is there a specific point that you didn't, understand. I mean, I can briefly go over it again. So um, in the hypothalamus, we, okay, no worries, everything is fine. So in the hypothalamus, we have a center, okay? And this center uh, regulates our food intake, right? So it determines whether we feel the need to eat or whether we feel full, okay? As simple as that. And there are several like signals that come from our gastrointestinal tract or come from uh, fat in our body that can stimulate these centers. And depending, like if something, if a signal comes from the GIT and this signal stimulates feeding, if you're stimulating feeding, then you would feel more hungry, right? Because your, your body's telling you that you need to eat. And that leads to hyperphagia. However, satiety, on the other hand, which we said means, you know, the feeling of being full, so it's the opposite of hunger, and if something stimulates this center, which is satiety, then you would feel hypophagia, which is decreased tendency to eat. So it's basically, it's, it's a lot of um, complex terms, if you will, but it determines whether you're hungry or whether you're full, depending on which side it stimulates. Was that okay for the, the person that asked me to repeat? Okay. Okay. So keep this picture in mind because now we're going to talk about what exactly these signals are that can cause you to feel hungry or that can cause you to feel full. Okay. Now, my favorite thing about GIT is that, you know, it's, it's easy to picture things happening. Um, because this is something that we do every day, you know, every day we, we eat and every day it's like digested and, and you know more than you think you do. Okay. 
So first of all, picture yourself having a meal. Okay, so whenever you have food entering your stomach, the first thing that your stomach is going to want to do is make space for that food. Okay, and it does this by stretching. So this is known as gastric distension. So what happens is when the food enters your stomach and your stomach stretches to, to make space for it, this will send signals through the vagus nerve. And this is a nerve that you will hear a lot of uh, throughout all of uh, the GIT physiology lectures. So stretching of the stomach or gastric distension stimulates the vagus nerve, which will cause decreased levels of hunger by stimulating satiety. Okay, and that makes sense because you just had something to eat. Your body knows that there's food in, in your stomach, so there's no reason for you to feel hungry. Okay, does, that, does the first factor make sense to everyone? You can just say yes or no and I, I can repeat. Yes, it made sense, thank you. Okay, um, okay so for the person that said no, um, I'll, I'll go over it again briefly. So what happens is, let's say you have um, an apple, okay? The most basic example. Let's say you take a bite out of an apple, right? You're going to swallow that apple and the apple enters your stomach, okay? And in order for the stomach to make space for the apple, it's going to stretch, okay? So if something is entering your stomach, it's gonna want to make room for it. So this stretching of the stomach sends a signal, sends a signal through the vagus nerve. And this signal tells your body that, you know, you're not hungry anymore because you already have food in your system. Did, did that make more sense? I can, okay, I'm glad, no worries. Okay, so let's move on to the second factor. Now, apart from gastric distension, what happens to the food in your stomach, it's that it's going to be digested, right? And do you guys know what the, um, what specifically is going to be digested in the stomach? Is it uh, carbohydrates? Is it proteins? Is it lipids? Like what's the most um, thing that's going to be digested? It, exactly, proteins. So. What happens is that when this food is digested and proteins are broken down, you have the release of peptides because that's what makes up our proteins, okay? So these peptides that are released from the digestion of your food in the stomach will cause the release of something known as CCK. And CCK is known as cholecystokinin and it's released from the intestine. Okay, so just like gastric distension, cholecystokinin is going to stimulate the vagus nerve and cause you to feel less hungry, which again, if you think about it, it makes sense because your body is receiving nutrients. You have peptides, which means that you already have food in your system, which would make sense that your body's telling you that you don't need to be hungry anymore. You know, you already have the nutrients that you need. Did that make sense, that factor? Okay, um, so just to summarize again, uh, the food in your stomach is broken down and mainly we have protein that's broken down in the stomach. We have the enzyme pepsin, uh, if you guys have studied that or, or, or learned about it yet. Uh, so that's going to break down our proteins. And when these proteins are broken down, it's, it's broken down into their building blocks, right? And proteins are made up of amino acids and peptides. So the more protein you have broken down, the more peptides you will have that are released. And what these peptides do is that they stimulate the release of CCK. So when CCK is released from the intestine, it's gonna stimulate the vagus nerve, and then this will cause um, stimulation of the satiety center, which means that you'd have decreased levels of hunger, also known as hypophagia. Was that better? No. Uh, I, I will continue with this slide. And then uh, if you guys have any questions, just stop me um, just so we you know, can, can 
keep our train of thought. So, um, okay, so the third factor are the levels of nutrients. And this is uh, pretty easy to understand because after you eat something, it's expected that your nutrient levels are going to increase. You get glucose, you get amino acids, you get fatty acids, and all of these levels in the blood are, gonna, are going to increase. Their concentration gets higher because you just, you, just, uh, you just have food, right? And what happens is when these nutrient levels increase and they enter the blood, it will directly stimulate satiety. So it doesn't through the, do this through the vagus nerve. Just by being in the blood, it will cause hypophagia, which is decreased levels of hunger, by stimulating satiety. I think this is the easiest one to understand. Uh, okay, so now that we're done with, with these three uh, factors, we'll move on to something known as ghrelin. So the way I memorized ghrelin, and I don't know if any of you can like relate to this, uh, but ghrelin always sounded like a hungry mythical beast to me. And uh, I know that sounds silly, but if you think about it, I've never ever forgotten the function of ghrelin because of that. So ghrelin stimulates feeding. And ghrelin is something, is a hormone that is released from the stomach and it enters the blood and it stimulates feeding, which will cause, do you guys think that will cause hyper or hypophagia from what we discussed? Hypophagia? Oh, no, wait, hyperphagia. Hyper, exactly. Because you're which means we're going to be hungry. Exactly, perfect. So that's what ghrelin does, okay? Um, and so ghrelin causes you to feel hungry. Now, let's say you already had something to eat. Your body has the nutrients that it needs. You wouldn't want ghrelin anymore, right? Because there's no reason for you to still feel hungry. So we need to have something that can inhibit ghrelin to stop it from you know, working when we don't need it to be there. And this is where uh, leptin comes into play. But leptin is different than all these other factors that we just mentioned. So it's different from gastric distension, CCK, the nutrient levels, and ghrelin, because leptin is more of a long-term hormone. What does that mean? So every single factor that we just mentioned, stretching of the stomach, release of CCK, and the nutrient levels increasing, as well as ghrelin, these can all happen um, on the spot. So if, you're, if you don't have enough uh, nutrients in your body, then you'll have high levels of ghrelin. If you just had a meal, your stomach will immediately stretch. You'll have release of CCK, your nutrient levels will increase. But when it comes to leptin, it doesn't happen overnight. This isn't something that happens directly after one meal. Because leptin, and we see this in the next slide, leptin uh, comes from adipose tissue. So the more adipose tissue a person has in their body, and that happens over time, um, you start to develop or accumulate more fatty tissue. And as that increases, leptin also increases. So that's why we say that leptin is more of a long-term hormone. And leptin, I want you guys to answer this. If leptin inhibits ghrelin, what do you think leptin would cause, hyper or hypophagia? Hypophagia. Perfect. Okay, I'm so happy you guys are getting it. Okay, so leptin would cause hypophagia. And just like you guys uh, mentioned, leptin is going to inhibit ghrelin. And it can also directly cause uh, hypophagia just by being in the blood. So those are the two ways that it can uh, suppress food intake or suppress your hunger. So everything we, we just mentioned so far, does, does all of it make sense? Okay, I love how there's still second years in here. Okay, um, all right. So now we're gonna move on to the second center, which is also in our hypothalamus. Uh, this is the thirst center. So instead of talking about uh, food intake, when you want to eat, when you don't want to eat, this is more about when you feel the need to drink water, when you're not thirsty and all of that. So the thirst center is also located in the hypothalamus, but it's the anterior part. So there's an interior and a posterior part to the hypothalamus. Uh, thirst center would be in the anterior. I don't know how much you need to worry about this, but it's just one of those details. So the main factor that will stimulate thirst 
in other words, the main factor that will cause you to want to drink water is an increase in plasma osmolality. Now, I know osmolality is, uh, can be a difficult concept to understand. So how many of you, do you guys actually understand what plasma osmolality means? Uh, yes or no is fine. I will explain it nonetheless, but I just wanna know how much detail we need to get into. Okay, so, okay, so a high plasma osmolality. Uh, when plasma osmolality is high, you get more thirsty. So you feel the need to drink more water. And why is that? So think of a high plasma osmolality as having a high solute concentration in the plasma. So let's say this is solute concentration and this is water. If plasma osmolality is high, it would look something like this. So solutes would be much higher than, than the water in your plasma. So it would make sense that if you have high plasma osmolality, which looks like this, your body will tell you to drink more water because it wants to make it even. Okay, so this is one of the indications, a high plasma osmolality is one of the indications that you need more water in your body. And this is the most important factor that stimulates thirst. Did that make sense? Okay. That's honestly how I understood it, uh, doing the whole like ratio thing. It, it helped to make sense to it or, you know, make it make sense. So uh, this is the most important one. As you can see, like only a one to 2% increase, which is a very, very small increase. Only one to 2% increase in the plasma osmolality is enough to stimulate the thirst center. Whereas for other factors like Sure, I can repeat. Uh, just let me finish the slide and I'll, and I'll go back to it if that's okay. Um, so we were saying for uh, plasma osmolality, it only takes like a one to 2% change to stimulate thirst. On the other hand, for things like uh, salvation and blood volume, it takes a lot more for you to feel thirsty. Like if there's a 10 to 15% decrease in blood volume or salvation, that's when you start to feel thirsty. Whereas for plasma osmolality, it's only 1% to 2%. So that shows you how um, important it is. Okay, so uh, I will repeat the idea of like plasma osmolality. So as I was saying, uh, a high plasma osmolality uh, means that you have high solute concentration in the blood. So let's say like the ions in your blood uh, are much higher than the water. So at, they're at a higher concentration than, than the water in your plasma, which means that there's not enough water to be able to have them cancel each other out, if that makes sense, okay? So when you have high plasma osmolality, meaning high ionic or high solute concentration in the plasma, your body would, would take that as an indicator and say, hey, there's not enough water to, to dilute that solute concentration. So that's why, it needs to stimulate the thirst center. And that's why it does, this high plasma osmolality will stimulate the thirst center to bring the water from here to here and you know decrease that plasma osmolality. So because when solutes and water are at the same level, you can say that they kind of cross each other or cancel each other out. Uh, however, if solute concentration is, is higher than the water, then, then that is what a high plasma osmolality means. And that would mean that you need more water in your system. All right, so it gets stimulated the thirst center by hypothalamic uh, osmoreceptor. Yes, I'm, I'm going to get to that now. Uh, just I just want to go through the other two factors before we talk about the receptors. But I just I want to make sure that you got the you got the whole idea of plasma osmolality. Okay, of course. Um, okay, so the other two factors are pretty straightforward. Is osmolarity the opposite of osmolality? See, that is a very good question. Um, that is something that always confused me. So I would rather reply to you later on, just so I can make sure that I give you the right answer. But what I can tell you now is that, uh, just like focus on, on this factor, I don't know how much you need to know about osmolarity right now, uh, 
but if you don't mind, I will reply to you later just to make sure that I don't give you any wrong information, if that's okay. Um, okay, so the other two factors are pretty straightforward, um, and it's something that you've got you you've obviously like experienced before. When you feel like your mouth is dry and you have less saliva being produced, the first thing you want to do is drink water, right? And that's exactly what this is saying. So when you have low salvation, that leads to a dry mouth, dry throat, and it's really like it's an uncomfortable feeling, and that causes stimulation of the thirst center, which is why we want to go drink water. Um, on the other hand, you have something known as uh, our blood volume, and if blood volume uh, decreases by 10 to 15 percent, then that would also stimulate the thirst center, so you can drink more water and increase that blood volume. Okay, and um, so I've been saying that these factors are going to stimulate the thirst center. Um, you know, they're going to they're going to cause stimulation. How do they? do that stimulation, it's through these specific receptors known as osmoreceptors. Uh, if you break down the word, osmo uh, refers to water, so it makes sense. It's why they're called osmoreceptors. And the way I uh, like to memorize that, uh, the osmoreceptors for plasma osmolality are in the hypothalamus, whereas the others are in the oropharynx, is by saying that you know, we talked about how plasma osmolality is the most important factor, right? So because it's the most important factor, it would need direct contact with the thirst center, which is why its osmoreceptors are located in the hypothalamus. So that's just a, a way that I use to help me memorize it. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it for this slide. Do you guys have any questions about this except for the osmolarity question? I promise I will get back to you. Uh, but anything else uh, before we move on? Uh, okay, so all clear. Okay, so this is our first checkpoint. I have a lot of these, and um, it's only a coincidence that they're all SpongeBob memes. Uh, I promise it's it's not like an obsession or something. But I just want to see if there's any no's in the chat. So do you guys get everything we discussed? Okay. Uh, can you repeat the last part between? Sure. Okay, so uh, this is a small detail. Again, I don't remember us getting tested on it, but these factors, all of them, plasma osmolality, salvation, and blood volume, they all interact with the thirst center through osmoreceptors. So these are just specific receptors um, related to the thirst center. So these are located in the hypothalamus, they're located uh, also in the oropharynx. And the way that I was just sharing a way that uh, I memorized which one was in the hypothalamus and which one was in the oropharynx. So the most important factor is plasma osmolality that we mentioned. Um, and this is very important to remember that this is the most important factor that stimulates thirst. And because it's the most important factor, then it would need direct contact with the thirst center, which is in the hypothalamus, which makes sense that its receptors are also located in the hypothalamus. It's just like, it's, if you don't get that point, it, it's okay, you don't have to like dwell on it, um, but it's just something that helped me understand. So because it's the most important, its receptors are as close as possible to the hypothalamus. Whereas for salvation, when you have a, a dry mouth, Right, you're gonna want osmoreceptors that are close to that area, which is why, sorry, which is why it's going to be in the oropharynx. Okay, perfect, no problem. Okay, so first checkpoint, we're good. Okay, so this is a pretty uh, easy slide. Not much explanation, but uh, there is just a few key points that you have to memorize. So in our mouth, we have uh, a lot of salivary glands. We have major glands and we have minor glands. And even though you guys only see three here, uh, we actually have like 600 to 1,000 really tiny minor salivary glands. But the most important ones that you do need to know is the parotid gland, which is this large one over here. 
And then you have one gland below the tongue, which is known as sublingual, sub for below and lingual for tongue. And then you have another one, which is uh, below the mandible. This is your mandible and uh, it's called submandibular, right? So they're, so sublingual, submandibular are easy to remember because of you know, their location and the way they're named. And uh, they're also very similar in terms of, they're also similar in terms of what they secrete. So the parotid one is like the, the odd one out, you know? So for the parotid gland, uh, the fluid that it secretes, contributing to the saliva, uh, the fluid that it secretes is more watery. So it's not uh, a thick kind of fluid, it's serous, you know? And it, because it's a watery non-viscous solution, it'll be easy to remember that it contains water and it contains electrolytes. Uh, it also contains proteins, uh, which you can memorize by, you know, P parotid for proteins. Uh, but everything else, it's just something that you just have to keep in mind. So the parotid gland secretes more watery solutions that contain protein, water, and electrolytes, whereas sublingual, which is this one, and submandibular, they secrete more of a thick solution, okay? So um, that's known as something that is more viscous. Viscous just means thick. And this is because they contain uh, specific substances known as mucins. Now, mucins are, uh, do you guys know what mucus is? It's that thick kind of uh, saliva. So mucins is a part of that. So mucins is just a glycoprotein that is within mucus. And because these uh, glands contain fluid containing mucins, it would make sense for it to be thick. It's a viscous solution. Can I move on to the next slide? Okay. So, um, okay, let's just kind of orient ourselves to what we're looking at. So let's take the parotid gland, for example. Let's take let's take one of these like circles over here and the duct. This is going to be it enlarged. Okay. So we're looking at a salivary gland. And in the salivary gland, uh, you mainly have two parts, okay? So you have this part, the more round part. It's kind of like the top of a broccoli, if you will. Uh, the more round part, and then you have the straight parts. So the round parts are called uh, asini or asini, however you want to pronounce it. Um, and the straight parts are the ducts. So what happens here in the in the well, they're all called asini or asini, and one is called an asinus. So what happens here in the asini is that saliva is being produced. So we're creating the saliva. And as the saliva comes into the lumen of the gland, and as it passes through the duct, that's where it's going to become modified. And by modification of saliva, that, that basically just means that we're changing the concentration of the ions. So we're absorbing some ions and we're secreting some ions. So over here, just to recap, in the asinus, we have production of saliva, and in the duct, we have modification of saliva. Now, if you guys notice, we also have these like flat yellow cells uh, around the asinus, and these are called myoepithelial cells. And if I'm not mistaken, you guys took this in your previous blocks. Does anyone know the reason why we have myoepithelial cells here in the asinus specifically? You can unmute your mic or you can type it in the chat. So that we can be able to secrete the glands to crush them? Exactly, perfect. Um, so yeah, like just like you said, and also like you guys said in the chat, uh, they contract in order to move the saliva into the duct or the fluid into the duct. Um, so that's, that's basically their entire purpose here. Okay, so again, to summarize, the asinus produces saliva, the duct will modify saliva, and then the myoepithelial cells will basically just contract uh, to push the saliva out. Okay, now we have this slide. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know about you guys, but this slide like really did it for me in GIT. Like it was the first slide that really freaked me out. Um, so how, how many of you like are, are actually terrified of this slide? Maybe I was just being dramatic last year, I'm not sure. 
Okay. Um, okay, well, you guys are good so far. Okay, so I'm not alone. That's good. It's good to know that we're all freaking out over the same things. Um, okay, so I have, I have good news for you. Um, we're going to go through every single step together. Okay. I'm going to explain it as best as I can. And uh, unfortunately, you do have to memorize it. However, uh, I found that trying to like link all the channels together and following one ion, like following sodium throughout its journey or chloride and its journey and potassium, you know, and where it goes, that also helps in memorization instead of like memorizing them uh, as individual channels, you know, and then just just like memorizing them without linking them together. So ready to start? I think this is the, the biggest part of the, the lecture. So after this, you guys are like completely good, inshallah. Okay. Okay, so here, this is, do you guys remember what part of the saliva, uh, the salivary gland this is? Acinus. Perfect, it's the acidus. And here we have the production of saliva, like we said. So the main uh, point here and something that you have to remember is the production of saliva is due to the movement of chloride ions, okay? So the fact that we have chloride ions coming into the gland, that's the reason why all of the fluid is, is being secreted as well. So it's driven by chloride ions. So uh, let's quickly orient ourselves with this picture. Uh, so do you guys see these blue cells over here? Let's take this one. So this blue cell is basically this enlarged. So it's the exact same thing. We're just looking at it um, in a bigger picture. And on the left side, we have the lumen, which is the inside of the gland. And then on the right side, we have the interstitium, which is basically this white part. So everything outside the gland. Okay. So we said that uh, the main reason why we have fluid secretion is due to the movement of chloride ions. Okay. So obviously our main goal is to bring chloride ions into the cell. And we do this through a very common uh, transporter that again, you will see in all of almost all of your GRT lectures, which is the physiology ones at least, which is the sodium chloride potassium uh, transporter. Okay, so this is the reason why we're bringing in or we're able to bring in chloride into the cell. All right, so let's follow uh, every single ion and, and see where it goes. Let's start with sodium, okay? Let me just try and get a laser pointer. Maybe that would be easier, okay. So let's start with sodium. So sodium comes in, again, through the sodium chloride potassium transporter. And then it immediately goes out through the sodium potassium pump. Okay, now why does this happen? Why, why are we bringing sodium just to take it out again? Okay, this is because the main reason that the sodium chloride potassium pump is working, right? And the reason why we're able to bring chloride ions into the cell is because of a low uh, sodium concentration inside of the cell. I'll explain that again. So the reason why sodium is able to come in and bring in chloride and potassium along with it is because of the concentration gradient, okay? So because we have high sodium outside and a low sodium concentration inside the cell, this channel is always going to be working, right? And if we constantly bring in sodium chloride and potassium, the sodium inside the cell could accumulate. The concentration of sodium could increase. And once that happens, this channel will not work as efficiently anymore. So we need to have a mechanism to take out that sodium as soon as it's brought in. And that's why it goes through the sodium potassium pump. Did that first point make sense? Alhamdulillah, okay, really glad. Okay, so it goes through the sodium potassium pump. And this is what I mean by trying to like link the channels together. So when you're repeating this to yourself, 
don't worry, we'll go over it again for those of you who don't get it. Um, but for, okay, so we said sodium goes out through the sodium potassium pump. And, and this is what I meant by um, linking the channels together. So when you're uh, repeating this to yourself uh, without looking at the slides and you're trying to memorize it, when you immediately say sodium potassium pump, that brings you to the next ion. So you already talked about sodium, and now you know that potassium is a part of the story because you just mentioned a sodium potassium pump, which means potassium is going to come in. Okay, so everything can be connected together, and that uh, makes it a lot easier to memorize it. So uh, I'm going to repeat sodium again quickly. Um, so we have this channel called the sodium chloride potassium uh, co-transporter or transporter. And this is the main reason why we're able to bring chloride into the cell. And this is dependent on a low sodium concentration within the cell. Because if the sodium concentration inside the cell was high, then this sodium on the outside wouldn't feel attracted to come into the cell. And if this sodium didn't come in, chloride wouldn't come in. And we need chloride because we said chloride is the main reason that um, we have fluid secretion and we can, we can produce our saliva. Okay, so as soon as the sodium comes in, in order to make sure that the concentration in the cell is low, then we need to take it out by the sodium potassium pump. Was that a better explanation? Okay. Um, tamam. So we'll move on to the next point. Okay, so let's take another ion. Uh, let's focus on potassium. So potassium comes in and potassium is, uh, it's very simple. Uh, it, it either goes out it back into the interstitium or it can go into the lumen. And it does this through uh, its own channels. They're called potassium channels. So there's nothing really to, to explain there. Now let's talk about uh, chloride. So chloride is the main reason why we're all here. It's the main reason why we have saliva. So chloride comes in through the sodium chloride potassium transporter. Again, I'm going to keep repeating the names so we can memorize them together. So chloride comes in, and if you follow this red line, chloride is going to go out through this anion channel. But if you notice, chloride is not leaving the cell on its own, right? Chloride is leaving with bicarbonate. Okay. And where does this bicarbonate come from? Are you guys aware of this reaction? the carbon dioxide with water? Like, have you guys seen this reaction before? Okay, perfect. So you guys know that when carbon dioxide combines with water, you get bicarbonate ions and you get hydrogen ions, all right? So the bicarbonate that is leaving the cell with chloride comes from this reaction. Okay, so it doesn't come from it doesn't come from nowhere, right? It, it comes from this reaction. Now, during this reaction, as you guys can see, we also have hydrogen ions that are produced. So, what do you guys think? Do you guys think that it's okay to just keep these hydrogen ions in the cell and not have any way to take them out? And if if no, why do you think that that's not okay? Like, why do you think we have to take out these hydrogen ions? Exactly, then the cell will become, the, the pH will decrease, which is what you guys are saying, it becomes acidic. So you need a way to take out the hydrogen ions. And this is done through the sodium hydrogen exchanger. Now, why is it called that? It's called that because we're exchanging an ion, an a hydrogen ion for a sodium ion. Okay, so I can repeat, I'll repeat chloride again, just so we can go over it. Chloride comes in through the sodium chloride potassium pump, and then it will go into the lumen through the anion channel. Because we need chloride to go into the lumen of the gland so the fluid can follow. Now, chloride is also leaving with bicarbonate, and bicarbonate comes from the reaction of carbon dioxide and water. But while you're producing bicarbonate, you're also producing hydrogen ions. And just like you guys said, we cannot leave these hydrogen ions in the cell because then it would become, uh, the pH would be too low. So we need to take this hydrogen out 
And we do this through the sodium hydrogen exchanger. So we're taking out a hydrogen into the interstitium for exchange uh, of sodium. Does that make sense? Can you just uh, repeat the bicarbonate part? Sure, okay. So uh, bicarbonate is leaving with chloride into the lumen, right? We can all agree on that. So these two ions are going to take this channel and enter the lumen. So where does the bicarbonate actually come from? Within the cell, this is all happening in the cell, we have carbon dioxide and we have water. And when these two interact or when these two react with one another, they will form like the end products are going to be hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Okay, so this bicarbonate over here that's leaving with chloride, this is where it comes from. It comes from this reaction, which happens within the cell. Okay, but while we're producing bicarbonate, we're also producing hydrogen ions. And we can't just ignore them because if the hydrogen ions accumulate within the cell, then that would cause uh, acidosis or it would cause a decrease in the pH. So we need to have a way to take out these hydrogens to prevent them from accumulating. And that's done through the exchanger over here, the sodium hydrogen exchanger. And again, we said it's called, it's given this name because it exchanges hydrogen ions for sodium ions. Was that clear? Yes. Okay. So you guys basically got through the the hard part of, of this slide. Uh, one of the, uh, the easiest things to understand now is the movement of water, okay? Now, I think you guys can, you guys can explain this like much better than, than I can. And it's easy to understand because if you have ions coming into the lumen, right? So you have, let's, we, we said potassium is coming into the lumen. We said chloride and bicarbonate is coming into the lumen. So if we have an increase in the solute concentration inside the lumen, right? Do you think water is going to follow that or is water not gonna be attracted to that higher solute concentration? Exactly, it will follow. So water is coming in. Um, see, you guys don't even have to memorize it because you know that solutes are coming in. We talked about potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, they're all going into the lumen. So you guys know that logically water is going to have to follow. So that brings you to the last step. So over here, you can see um, there are two ways that water can come into the lumen of the salivary gland, okay? The first way is through special uh, channels that are specifically made for water. Um, and I don't know if you guys have heard of this before, but it's mainly like if you've heard of aquaporins, then it's mainly in association with the kidneys. But aquaporins, aqua stands for water, and porins is our, our pores or uh, means in which the water can exit, right? So these aquaporins will take the water and allow it to exit into the lumen and follow these ions. So that's, that's the first way that water can enter the lumen through aquaporins. The second way that it can do that is through these, do you see these, um, do you see where two cells meet? Do you see this black line? Do I see it? Yes, no, okay. So this line is basically what they're showing you here. Okay, it's just magnified, okay? So water is also going to move through this, um, through this pathway, okay? And this is just sim simple diffusion. Here it's through aquaporins and here it's going to be just a diffusion of water. But you guys notice that water is not moving in alone. It's moving in with sodium. Okay, and why is sodium coming into the lumen? This is because of all the chloride. So we said that the main thing that's happening is that we're secreting chloride into the lumen. And chloride is a negative ion, right? So when you have more chloride inside the lumen, do you think the charge would be more negative or more positive? Have I lost you guys already? Where, where's everyone in the chat? <laughs> I just wanna make sure that you guys all know. Okay, perfect, negative. Okay, because chloride is 
is a negative ion, right? So if you have more chloride in the lumen, then the negative charge increases. And we all know that negative attracts positive. So if you have a negative environment inside the gland, then you're going to attract positive ions. And this is why sodium is coming in. Okay, so sodium is coming in because of what they call an electronegative environment that is generated by the entry of chloride, which is a negative ion. Okay. Did all of that make sense? Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so you guys made it through um, the ions. I mean, everything else from here is, is, is a lot easier. So, alhamdulillah, I'm happy. Um, one more point before we can like move on to the next slide. So as you can see here, it says that the net effect is plasma-like, is a plasma-like solution that is nearly isotonic. Okay, so does any, do you guys know what isotonic means? So you remember when we talked about like the solute to water ratio, so solutes and water, something, uh, a fluid that's isotonic, perfect, exactly, it would be equal. So solutes and water are gonna be equal. Potassium, sodium enters the lumen and chloride and bicarbonate enters too, so charge neutrality is maintained. Oh, are you talking about the electronegative environment? Okay, so, um, okay, yeah, I get what you're saying, um, but as you can, as you can see, the, the main drive, right, the main drive for saliva being produced or fluid being secreted is chloride ions. So even though we have potassium, even though we have uh, a little bit of sodium coming in, the main thing that's being secreted is chloride. So even though you still have a little bit of positive ions, the main thing is going to be the negative charge from the chloride. So this side or the lumen is going to be more negative than the interstitium, which is why sodium is attracted to this environment. But you're right, Yanni, potassium is coming in and you do have positive uh, ions, but it's still more negative. The lumen is still more negative than the interstitium. Okay. Okay. So back to what we were saying about uh, this fluid. So this fluid that we just produced in the acinus is isotonic, and just like one of, just like you guys said in the chat, um, that would mean that solutes and water are equal. Okay. And even though we have like potassium coming in, chloride and bicarbonate and sodium, we also have water coming in. Right. We talked about water coming in through aquaporins, and water is also coming in by diffusion. Right? So they're canceling each other out, which is why the fluid or the net effect is a fluid that's isotonic. All good? That's the, the last point of, of the slide, really. Okay, so can I, you guys are all okay if I move on to the next slide? Okay. Okay, so now we've moved on to the duct. Remember when we looked at this picture and we said that this is where we have modification of the saliva. So this is where, this is what we're looking at over here. Okay, now the summary of this slide and really everything you have to know is in these two lines. So our main goal is to absorb sodium and chloride. And our other goal is to secrete potassium and bicarbonate. That's everything that's happening in this part of the gland. And we're just going to talk about how that happens, okay? So first of all, let's take sodium. So sodium is, or wait, let's actually orient ourselves with the picture. So this blue cell over here is what we're looking at, but in, enlarged, in an enlarged form. Uh, this side, the right side of the big blue square is the lumen. So this is inside the gland. And then the left side is outside of the ducts. Okay, so let's start with sodium. So sodium is already in the lumen. Remember over here when we said sodium is coming in? So sodium is already inside the lumen. But now our main goal is to absorb this sodium. So 
on the side of the cell, okay, we have specific channels that can take in sodium. And these are known as the epithelial sodium channels, which is, the, which is what you see over here. So through these channels, sodium can come in. And the same reason for how, like when we talked about having to take the sodium out to maintain a low intracellular sodium concentration, for the same reason, we have to take sodium out through the sodium potassium pump, okay? Again, because if we continuously bring sodium in, it's the concentration of sodium in the cell is going to get higher, right? The sodium is going to accumulate. And then over time, the sodium inside the lumen will no longer want to come into the cell because the sodium concentration is too high. So in order to make sure that this channel is always working and sodium can always be absorbed, we have to take out the sodium uh, through the sodium potassium pump. And speaking of the sodium potassium pump, that would obviously mean that potassium is coming in. So sodium goes out, potassium comes into the cell. And because our main goal is to secrete potassium, as potassium comes into the cell, it immediately goes, goes out into the lumen through its own special, uh, not so special, but it's a potassium channel. Okay, so this is the first part. This is how we absorb sodium and how we secrete potassium. Now let's move on to bicarbonate and chloride. So as you can see over here, we have an anion exchanger. Okay, anion basically means a negative, a negative ion. So like chloride, like bicarbonate, they have a negative charge. And an exchanger means that you're taking in one thing and you're taking out another, okay? So because we want to absorb chloride, chloride is going to come into the cell. And because we want to secrete bicarbonate, bicarbonate will go into the lumen, or other words, into the saliva. Okay, so where does this bicarbonate come from? This bicarbonate comes from a channel known as the bicarbonate sodium co-transporter. And why is it called that? It's called a co-transporter because it's transporting sodium and bicarbonate at the same time through the same channel, okay? So uh, bicarbonate comes in, and then as soon as it comes in, it's exchanged for chloride. And then we said, we want to absorb chloride, right? So we need a channel on this side that's going to take the chloride back out into the interstitium. So this is exactly what's happening. As chloride enters through the bicarbonate chloride anion exchanger, the chloride goes into the interstitium through this anion channel, which is this pink channel over here. Okay. Now, the only way, if you guys notice, the only way that we can secrete bicarbonate into the saliva, which is what we want to do, we want to secrete bicarbonate, the only way that we can do that is if we bring chloride in. So if we had no chloride in the lumen, we wouldn't be able to secrete bicarbonate, okay? So we need to make sure that there's a constant supply of chloride in the lumen in order for us to make sure that we can always secrete bicarbonate. And this chloride comes from this channel, which is known as the CFTR channel. Um, and this is the channel that's actually involved in cystic fibrosis, okay? It's just a fun fact. I don't think you guys have to know this now. Um, but chloride enters the lumen through the CFTR. And what this, this does is it just simply makes sure that there's always chloride in the lumen that can be exchanged for bicarbonate. Okay, so that bicarbonate can be secreted along with potassium. And then we also absorb sodium and we absorb chloride. Okay, I, I will repeat, but did that make sense to, to everyone else? Okay, e ENAC is, it stands for epithelial sodium channels. So NA is sodium, E is epithelial, and C is channels. So they're just specific channels for sodium that allows it to be absorbed. Um, okay, for those that uh, asked me to repeat, do you want me to repeat everything? Or is there a specific point that you didn't understand? Again, I don't mind. If you want me to repeat everything, I will. I just want to make sure. All of a sudden, okay. No worries, we have, we have time, I think. Okay, so uh, 
we're in the ducts now, and our main job in the ducts is to modify the saliva. And we said modification means to absorb certain ions and to secrete others, okay? And our goal here is to absorb sodium and chloride and to secrete potassium and bicarbonate. So everything that happens here, we're all trying to like achieve the goal of taking in sodium and chloride, so removing it from the saliva and secreting potassium and bicarbonate and you know secreting it into the saliva. So that's what all the channels are trying to do, okay? So let's take sodium, which we said that it's going to be absorbed, right? The way that sodium is absorbed is through the epithelial sodium channels. Um, in this case, it is, yes, and it's, uh, it is a one-way channel here that's driven by the concentration gradient. Okay, so in order for the epithelial sodium channel to work in this case, then the sodium concentration in the lumen has to be higher than it is in the cell. So sodium can go from a high to low concentration. Okay, so no problem. So sodium comes in, okay, through the epithelial sodium channels. And because we said that we need to maintain this concentration gradient, we have to have high sodium here and low sodium here so that we can constantly or continuously absorb the sodium. And the way that we do that is by taking out the sodium. So we take the sodium out of the cell uh, through a sodium potassium pump. Does this make sense? Does this first part make sense? Yeah, so let me, let me just repeat it one, last, uh, one more time, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, go ahead. So uh, the saliva, which is in the lumen, we have to absorb, we have to modify it. So we absorb the Na in the saliva that gets released from the chlorine. Like it enters the lumen through, uh, like Na and Cl both enter the lumen, right? Uh, correct. So no, sodium and chloride, they're already in the lumen. We want yeah, to, yeah. We want to secrete it out. Uh, or like we, we need to like secrete it out from the, uh, from the, or like, sorry, absorb it from the uh, saliva. So okay. we absorb it through ENAC and it enters the cell and then uh, through, uh, and then from the cell it, it gets outside and then we change it with K, right? Exactly, so the sodium potassium pump. Yeah, and the K will enter uh, through the K channel to the lumen. Exactly, perfect, because we want to secrete potassium. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Um, okay, so now let's, let's move on to uh, bicarbonate and chloride. Okay, so the bicarbonate is going to be secreted into the lumen because we want to secrete bicarbonate. And this bicarbonate comes from this channel, which is the bicarbonate sodium uh, co-transporter, which simply just brings in bicarbonate and along with it brings in sodium, okay? So this bicarbonate comes into the cell and it's secreted into the lumen with an exchange with, exchanged with chloride. So this is why it's called an anion exchanger. So we're exchanging one for the other. So bicarbonate for chloride in this case. And this makes sense because we said that we want to absorb chloride, right? So we're bringing in chloride and we're taking in bicarbonate. Now, the thing that I was explaining is the only way that bicarbonate can leave the cell, right, is if chloride is exchanged for it. So bicarbonate can't leave without chloride coming in. So we need to make sure that there's always chloride in the lumen, correct? And, and the way that we can make sure that there's always going to be chloride here is through the CFTR channel, which makes sure that chloride can exit into the lumen and then be exchanged for bicarbonate. Okay, and then finally chloride is just going to, to be absorbed. So it goes through its own anion channel. Okay, for those that asked me to, to repeat, is everything clear now? Yes. Okay. I think someone else asked me to repeat. It's only your IDs, guys. I would call your names, but... Um, Okay, I'm gonna assume that it's clear. Uh, if it's not, you guys have my number. You can always 
uh, contact me and I can explain it again. Okay, Alhamdulillah, I'm glad. Okay, so that's everything to do with the ions. Um, but if you guys remember here in the previous slide, okay, in the previous slide, we said that the fluid that we produced is isotonic, right? Because the water and the solutes are equal and they cancel each other out, basically. However, here it's different. Here the fluid is hypotonic, which means that, do you guys think that means that water is more than solutes or water is less than solutes? Okay, so hypotonic basically means that um, you have more water than the solutes present in the fluid. Okay, so the water is, is diluting the solutes that are present. Okay, um, so it would basically mean that water is at this level and solutes are at this level. Okay, and this can be a bit confusing, even me studying this for the first time, it took me a while to understand, so don't worry. Uh, but what happens here, we said that we're absorbing sodium and chloride and we're secreting potassium and bicarbonate but we're not doing those to the same extent. So we're absorbing more sodium and chloride than we're secreting potassium and bicarbonate. So let's say we're here, this, there's a fluid within the lumen over here. We're taking out more sodium and more chloride, then we are secreting bicarbonate and potassium. So we're taking out more ions and we're replacing it with less, if that makes sense. So that's the first reason why there would be a lower solute concentration because you're taking out a lot of ions and you're only replacing it with with a few you're not replacing it with the same amount okay um, another reason why it's hypotonic is because of of this uh part over here so like we mentioned the space between these two cells are demonstrated by this black line over here and the permeability to water in the ducts are very low, which means that water cannot easily pass through the cells. So for these two reasons, the fact that we took out a lot of sodium and chloride and we replaced it with, with less bicarbonate and potassium, and the fact that there's low water permeability in the cells of the duct, that leads to the saliva being hypotonic, which means that the concentration of water is going to be more than the concentration of solutes. Did that make sense? Okay. And the fact that uh, the saliva here is hypotonic, this is a very important uh, characteristic of saliva because it, it's, it's the main reason why we can actually taste things. So the fact that saliva is hypotonic, that's important for our taste centers, taste sensors, also known as chemoreceptors. Okay. Our second checkpoint. Do you guys get it so far? Yes or no? Just the last part, the hypotonic. This hypotonic part? Yes. Okay. Uh, so hypotonic basically means that the water to solute ratio looks like this. So you have more water than you have solutes. Okay. Um, so that's because not a lot of water is leaving the lumen. So you still have a lot of water in the ducts, right? And you're taking out a lot of ions. So you're taking out sodium, you're taking out chloride, and you're only replacing it with, with um, you're replacing it with a less amount of bicarbonate and potassium. So you'd have a lower solute concentration. And because of the water that's remaining within the duct, because it doesn't easily pass through the cells, that causes the saliva to be hypotonic, which means, again, concentration of water is more than the concentration of the ions or the solutes. I get it now. Thank you. No problem. OK, so we did this checkpoint. Okay, so what's TJ? TJ stands for tight junctions. So this is what's present between the cells. Yeah. I think you guys took that in foundation? Not sure. 
Uh, but yeah, TJ is tight junctions. This is usually where water would pass, but here the uh, permeability of it to water is low. So that's why water will stay in the duct. Okay, so this is uh, a pretty simple concept. It's much easier than what we just discussed, okay? So we said that we have sodium and chloride absorbed and we have bicarbonate and potassium that is being secreted, okay? We can all agree on that. So what happens is that this is, so this is the duct, okay? This is saliva entering the duct and on this side, it's going to exit the duct, okay? And I want you guys to focus on sodium only. Forget, forget all of the other ions for now. So we said sodium is absorbed, right? It's, it's, it's over here, so you guys can keep reminding yourselves. Sodium is going to be absorbed. So that means we're going to take it out of the duct, okay? Uh, so what happens is when saliva is moving at a very fast rate, so there's, there's the saliva that's moving through the duct is moving by very fast there's not gonna be enough time for us to modify it, okay? There's not gonna be enough time for us to remove the sodium, okay? However, if the saliva is moving through the duct or the fluid is moving through the duct slowly or at a slower rate, then there will be enough time for us to modify it as much as we want. We can take in the sodium and uh, do all the other things that we talked about, okay? Does that, does that concept make sense to everyone? because this is what the next slides are, are based on. So if saliva is moving fast, then there's not enough time to modify it because it's, it's just passing by very quickly. However, if it's moving slowly, then there's more contact time and you can absorb sodium chloride, secrete more potassium and bicarbonate. Um, so, so this is the, the entire concept. So over here, uh, we have, um, okay, we have this amount, we have 100, this specific amount of sodium coming in and only 20 is coming out, okay? And this is slow perfusion, which means that we have time to modify it the way that we want to, okay? So you have sodium coming in, 100 is coming in, and because the saliva is moving slowly, we can absorb the sodium and then only 20 remains, which means that 80% of the sodium was absorbed and that's a very big amount, right? So 100 to 20, that's 80%. So a lot of sodium was absorbed because the saliva was moving slowly and there was enough time for us to modify it. However, take this picture. Now, same thing, we have 100 and we have another value on the other side. Just forget about it for a second. So let's imagine that saliva is moving within the duct very, very quickly, okay? There would be no time to modify the saliva. So there's, there would be no time to absorb the amount of sodium that we need to, right? So there would be less absorption of sodium, which is why 100 only changes to 90 because 10% of it was absorbed. Compared to, compared to this one where 80% of the sodium was absorbed because the saliva was moving slowly. However, when it moves fast, then less sodium is absorbed because there's not enough time to modify it. Does that make sense? Um, if saliva is moving fast, concentration doesn't change much. So it remains moderately isotonic. So the first part of the sentence, um, if the first part of your question was correct. So if saliva is moving fast, then the concentration of sodium doesn't change much. Uh, however, uh, we said that if you remember, Sorry, I can't go back to the previous slide. Okay, if you remembered, we ended with saliva being hypotonic, okay? So saliva is only isotonic when it's first produced in the acinus. And then once it's produced and modified, saliva is hypotonic. So here we're, we're only, we're just talking about um, like the, the modification of it. And we're only talking about one ion, you know? So I wouldn't say that it's completely isotonic because you'd still have bicarbonate, potassium, and chloride that can be edited, if that makes sense. But I, I think I do get your question. So if you don't have much modification, then it doesn't become as hypotonic as you want it to. So I, I guess you could be correct in that sense. Okay. 
yeah, I mean, you're right, because if it's if the saliva is moving fast, you have less modification. So it doesn't become it doesn't change from isotonic to hypotonic. Right. OK. So I have good news for you guys. If you got this for sodium, it's the same thing for chloride. It's the exact same thing. So sodium and chloride, um, these two ions, the extent to which they're absorbed depends on the rate in which the saliva is flowing. OK. And it's also the same thing for potassium. However, potassium is secreted, okay? So if the saliva is moving slowly, then we have enough time to modify it again. So more potassium will be secreted, right? So we'll end up with a greater concentration of potassium. Here we have 40 and we started out with 20, which means that it doubled, right? So you had a lot of potassium secretion because of the slow perfusion of saliva. However, if saliva is moving by too fast, then you have less modification right? So less potassium is secreted. So it only changes by one. It went from 20 to 21. So sodium, chloride, and potassium, they're all dependent on the uh, flow of the saliva. Now, I can repeat potassium, yeah. Okay, so just like sodium and chloride, um, the extent to which we can modify potassium depends on the rate of the saliva, okay? So if saliva or, the, or if the fluid is moving slowly, we have more time to modify, correct? And we said that, if you remember, potassium is secreted, okay? So if saliva is moving slow, then we, can, we have time to secrete the potassium, okay? So more potassium will be secreted, and the concentration of potassium in the gland or in the duct will increase, in the fluid will increase. So it goes from 20 to 40 when saliva is moving slowly. On the other hand, if saliva is moving too fast within the duct, then there wouldn't be enough time to secrete potassium, right? Because the saliva is moving by way too quickly and before you even wanna modify it, it's gone. So it only goes from 20 to 21 because the saliva is moving too fast. So the only difference between the concept that we discussed about sodium chloride and potassium is the fact that one's absorbed and one is secreted, but it's the same idea. Does that make sense? Okay. So we have an exception as we always do. Um, so our exception here is bicarbonate, okay? Now remember how we said when there is fast perfusion of saliva, when saliva is moving too quickly, you have less modification. Okay, in this case, bicarbonate doesn't really care about the rate of saliva because bicarbonate is stimulated or the secretion of bicarbonate is stimulated by parasympathetics. Okay, so if you have high parasympathetic activity, then you have a high secretion of bicarbonate into the saliva. Okay, so it doesn't matter if it's, if it's fast. If it's fast, that doesn't mean you'll have less modification for bicarbonate, okay? Um, it just depends on parasympathetics. So, um, so basically what I've understood is that parasympathetic will always release uh, bicarbonate or stimulate bicarbonate. So it doesn't matter if the saliva moves fast or slow, it's always going to have the same rate. But in the potassium and sodium, it depends. Yeah, so for sodium chloride and potassium, it depends on the rate of the saliva and how it's in and how fast or slow it's moving. But for bicarbonate, it's stimulated by parasympathetics. Um, so there's just one more thing I want to, to make clear. Uh, as you can see here, it's when there's slow perfusion of saliva and there's fast perfusion of saliva. When it's fast, more bicarbonate is secreted compared to when it's slow. So it's kind of the opposite of potassium, okay? And the reason why this happens is because of parasympathetic activity. So um, parasympathetic activity is the main um, stimulant that will cause saliva to be secreted. So when you have high parasympathetic activity, you have high secretion of saliva, which is why this parasympathetic activity will cause fast perfusion of saliva. So when it's fast, that means you have high parasympathetics. That would mean you also have a high secretion or a, a larger secretion of bicarbonate into the saliva. So it's mainly dependent on parasympathetics. 
So if it's if the saliva is moving too fast, it doesn't affect bicarbonate. It does the complete opposite. It actually helps it be secreted more because of the parasympathetic activity. I think we have a checkpoint. So do you guys get everything so far? Or at least this concept that we just explained. Okay, so uh, if we drink carbonated drink, the saliva would have a high amount of bicarbonate to neutralize it. So mainly the, the bicarbonate would be to neutralize something that's, that's acidic, right? Um, because that's why we have, uh, that's why our saliva is, is alkaline or it has high alkalinity with a high pH because of the amount of bicarbonate, right? So, um, and that's also why like the major stimulus for the secretion of saliva is an acidic taste because our saliva contains bicarbonate. And if we secrete that saliva, it would be able to uh, neutralize that. Okay, so uh, this is pretty uh, simple. Hopefully we'll be done in a few um, and you guys can like take a break. Um, the rest is, is pretty straightforward. So, okay. So like we said, we have parasympathetic activity, right? That can stimulate uh, the production and the secretion of saliva. However, we also have sympathetic activity. Now, the most important one is parasympathetic but sympathetic does have a little bit of an, an influence, okay? And they act uh, in two separate ways. So for parasympathetic, it's mainly through the action of acetylcholine. So what happens is acetylcholine binds to its receptor and through the inositol triphosphate pathway, it will increase the calcium levels. And this increase in calcium does two things, okay? It causes the release of water and electrolytes and it causes the release of amylase, mucin, and specific granules. Okay, so this is under the influence of parasympathetic. So again, parasympathetic through acetylcholine causes an increase in calcium, which leads to the release of water, electrolytes, amylase, and mucin with the granules. Okay, however, sympathetic, the less important one, um, will act through norepinephrine. And by norepinephrine, instead of causing calcium increase, it causes cyclic AMP increase, which is a pathway that I'm sure you guys are very familiar with um, at this point. So cyclic AMP increases. And what this does is it only causes the release of amylase and the mucin and the granules, okay? And do you guys now understand why parasympathetic would be more important? Because even just looking at it over here, through acetylcholine, parasympathetic can cause release of water electrolytes as well as amylase, mucin, and granules. Whereas sympathetic through norepinephrine and cyclic AMP only causes release of amylase, mucin, and the granules. So again, very, very important point. Parasympathetic is the dominant influence. Okay. Now this is just a uh, very like, uh, there's not much to explain here, except for maybe the last point. So we said that parasympathetic is the most dominant influence when it comes to saliva, the production of saliva, the secretion of it. So the saliva that is produced under the stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system is much more thick than sympathetic, okay? It's much more sustained, which means it is prolonged. Whereas for sympathetic, it's transient. So the saliva is produced for a little while and then it stops. However, for parasympathetic, the effect lasts longer. Uh, another differentiation is that parasympathetic, uh, the fluid that is secreted under the stimulation of parasympathetic is, uh, has less proteins than the sympathetic one. Um, and the most important thing I think in this slide is remember how we said parasympathetic is the dominant influence. So as you can see here for sympathetic, if we, cut off all the nerves, okay, that stimulate your uh, saliva production, then it has a very minimal effect. It won't decrease uh, salivary production too much, okay? However, on the other hand, if we like destroy or get rid of all of these uh, nerves that come from the parasympathetic nervous system uh, to the salivary glands, 
then you'd have a significant decrease in secretion of saliva and you'll also have something known as atrophy. Do, do any of you know what atrophy is? The, the death of the muscle? Yeah. You're right, it doesn't have to be a uh, muscle though. It can be, um, it's, it is weakness, okay? So it's uh, just um, when, so the sal salivary glands won't be working as efficiently as they do because they're not being stimulated anymore. Exactly, so, so weakness um, and all of that, that's, that's basically what happens here. And this is an even bigger indicator that the parasympathetic is the dominant influence because without it, the glandular cells, they atrophy and there's decreased secretion of the saliva. Okay, so this again, very straightforward. Um, so this is a graph here, this, uh, the y-axis shows you uh, salivary secretion. So how much saliva is produced? And uh, here you have different factors, okay? And we're gonna compare them and, and see how much they can cause uh, secretion in saliva. So as you can see at rest, there is little to no saliva that is being secreted. There's always going to be a little bit of saliva that is secreted, but it's a very, it's very close to zero, okay? Now what happens is when you start feeding, your salivary secretion increases. And this is for several reasons, whether it's for lubrication of your mouth to help with uh, uh, solubilizing and breaking down the food to help with swallowing of food for all of those reasons. But the biggest factor, the biggest stimulant for salivary secretion is something known as noxious uh, stimuli, which is anything that's acidic um, or even just like sores in your mouth or anything like that. Uh, mainly things that are acidic, that will cause the biggest, um, that will be the biggest stimulant for salivary secretion, even more than feeding. So this is something that, exactly, perfect, lime juice. Lime juice is a really good example uh, of a noxious stimuli. Do you guys also know, um, when you look at lemon or when you think of, of lemon, do you guys get that strange feeling in your mouth and you, do, you actually do feel the, the saliva being produced? Yeah, so this is a perfect example of, of what noxious stimuli is and how it can cause secretion of saliva. Okay. So, uh, okay, so we talked about how saliva is produced and all of that. Now, why do we need saliva? We mentioned a few examples already. So it hydrates your mouth. Um, it also promotes wound healing because it contains specific growth factors um, like you guys, wait, can you guys still hear me? Because um, I think my internet is unstable. Okay, if at any point you can't hear me, just uh, let me know. Uh, okay, so like you guys mentioned, uh, the bicarbonate within the saliva neutralizes the acid. And this helps protect a specific uh, layer on our teeth, which is a protective layer. Um, another thing that it also helps kill bacteria. and. It's, which is called, it has antimicrobial actions. Um, this reminds me of POD, which is why I was taken aback a bit. So bactericidal and bacteriostatic are just uh, fancy ways of saying that it, um, it's antimicrobial. So it helps against uh, bacteria in your mouth. And uh, another thing is that it facilitates speech. So just by keeping your mouth lubricated, it helps you talk. And these are all functions of saliva that occur between meals. So we haven't even got to what it can do when you're actually eating and when you're actually having a meal. So during meals, uh, like I mentioned, it helps you, it helps with mastication, which is a very fancy word to just say chewing. Um, it helps with mastication, it helps with swallowing because of the lubrication. Like imagine trying to swallow food when your throat and your mouth is dry, like, you know? So that's another function of it. It also, as we mentioned, it buffers uh, acids through the bicarbonate. And for people that have uh, acid reflux, where gastric acid from the stomach finds a way up into the esophagus, um, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Uh, it also helps buffer this. And another thing is um, by solubilizing the food, so by breaking down the food and making it soluble, it helps us taste it. It, enhance the, it enhances the taste of food. And the last thing, is saliva contains um, these two enzymes. So you have alpha amylase and lingual lipase, which mainly break down starch and uh, lipid digestion, but it's, it's limited digestion. So there is more digestion that takes place as the food goes down the GIT. Uh, but here there is 
a very, um, there is a little bit of digestion of uh, starch and lipids. And this is important, especially this lingual lipase, because with people with um, pancreatic insufficiency, and these are people that, um, let's say they lose their ability to um, break down fat in the intestine with lipase or pancreatic lipase, which is an enzyme that comes from the pancreas. So they will heavily rely on the lipid digestion that occurs in the mouth by the lingual lipase. And these are just, uh, so here it's showing you what can happen if we don't have saliva. So obviously the first thing would be dry mouth, which the fancy word for it is xerostomia. Uh, you can have, you can start to develop ulcers because one of the reasons would be we don't have anything to neutralize the acid, right? So that can cause damage to mucosal membranes. Uh, another thing are dental caries, which uh, is due to the absence of the antimicrobial action. So you can have, start to have bacteria. And lastly, dysphagia. Dysphagia is uh, difficulty swallowing, which we mentioned here. Because saliva helps with lubrication, it also helps you swallow. So without saliva, you would experience dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing. Um, tamam. So now we have, uh, this is kind of like a, a little bit of a recap. So we said parasympathetic works through what ion? Do you guys remember? To stimulate salivary secretion. Acetylcholine. Yes, perfect. Um, and we said sympathetic works through Norepinephrine. There we go. Okay. I love how you said norepi. This <laughs> is a cute name. Okay. So, um, okay, perfect. So you guys remember that. So all of this leads to saliva and we saliva production. And we said the dominant influence is parasympathetic or sympathetic? Parasympathetic. Okay, perfect. So we have certain things that will increase parasympathetic activity and certain things that will decrease uh, parasympathetic activity and thus increase and decrease saliva production respectively. So uh, these things are like thought of food, the sight of food, smell of food, um, things like that can increase parasympathetic activity and cause you to salivate. And there are other things that are not even related to food like, um, like sleep, uh, like fear, and these can inhibit salivary secretion. So you have two uh, specific phases where saliva can increase. The first one is cephalic phase and cephalic phase uh, has a lot to do with the brain. So it's um, anticipation of food. So you're either looking at food, you're smelling food, even sometimes just the thought of food can make us salivate, right? And this is transient, which means it doesn't, um, it doesn't last if you don't have something to eat. So if I'm thinking of food now and I'm salivating, and I don't have a meal, this salivation is just gonna disappear, okay? But if I do actually end up having a meal, that's when salivation, salivation will continue. Okay, now the other phase is called the oral phase, and oral because you're actually ingesting food, and things such as taste and texture, these will all increase um, salivary secretion. And it's very, it's very interesting actually, if you think about it, because when it comes to texture, Things that are smooth um, increase saliva secretion much more than things that are rough, just, just because of the texture. It has nothing to do with taste. Um, it's just texture. Something that's smooth will increase saliva much more than something that's um, rough, uh, as well as, as taste. Something that is more sour, um, like lemon, for example. If you, I don't know if you've ever tried just having lemon on its own. Um, that will increase saliva a lot more than something else would. So if you guys see, there's this uh, word here, which is called uh, conditioning. Now, I don't think you need to know this, um, but it's basically when, uh, so we, by I don't think you need to know this, I mean, we didn't get tested on it last year, but just in case I will explain it. Uh, conditioning is when you um, associate one thing with another, okay? And in this case, you would associate uh, one thing with the idea of food. So. To explain this, um, Dr. Peter included uh, this experiment, uh, which is um, a really big part of psychology. And I'm gonna explain this. You don't really have to know this in, in detail, but just in case I will say this. Um, so what Pavlov did, Pavlov um, 
uh, had a dog, okay? And Pavlov realized that whenever the dog would look at food, he would salivate or it would salivate, okay? At the sight of food, right? Which is what we talked about here. I'm trying to go back. Okay, uh, what well, we talked about here in the cephalic phase. So the sight, smell of food will cause you to salivate. And that's exactly what happened with this dog. Now, Pavlov wanted to see if he would be able to um, condition the dog in a way that the dog would start to associate the sound of the bell with the sight of food. Okay, so every time that Pavlov gave the, the dog food, he would ring a bell. So he would give the dog food and ring a bell at the same time. And over time, he did this so many times. And over time, um, when Pavlov would ring the bell, the dog would salivate even without the presence of food. So the dog had no food in its sight, no, no smell of food, no sight of food, nothing. But just by hearing the sound of the bell, the dog started to salivate. And that is what conditioning means. Okay, so even just by association, me associating something with food, if I think of that something, that will cause me to salivate. And that's exactly what's explained here. And like that, we are done with the first lecture. <laughs> um, so you guys can uh, take a break now. Of course, if you have any questions, I will be here. Um, any questions you want me to repeat something i can go back um can i just like uh, explain the parasympathetic and sympathetic salivation uh, i just want to make sure like i understand sure but um, um let, let's just decide on a time that everyone else can come back so whoever wants to go uh, can go now um no no i don't want you to explain it to you i just like want to explain it to you so like i don't think it's really important like if they don't want no not not this the first slide after the checkpoint number three. this one yes yes this one so what happens in here uh is that uh, first thing first in parasympathetic we release acetylcholine right yes uh, it gets stimulated by acetylcholine and after that the acetylcholine will release ip3 and then the IP3 will release calcium and the calcium will release the aimless and the mucosin and the ions. Yes, right? this is sympathetic. Yes. And the and the and then the uh, 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 sympathetic, what's gonna happen is gonna release uh, uh, neopyriaphrine and the neopyriaphrine with ATP, it's going to make uh, an adenal. Cyclase, so ATP and uh, adenal cyclase, cyclic AMP, which we're gonna release only mucosin and amylase. Amylase, that's it. Yes, perfect, exactly. Okay, that's basically it because I didn't like write notes about it, so like I just want to write notes about it, and that's why I'm asking. Yeah, you explained it perfectly. That that was it, and don't forget that parasympathetic is the dominant influence. Yeah, 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 yes. That's right, because it releases not only ions, but also it releases mucosin and amines. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a way that you can remember it um, pertaining to this slide. But um, usually when it comes to anything related to the digestive system, it's always parasympathetic. So parasympathetic is the dominant influence when it comes to, um, you know, your rest or digest, right? And uh, that involves salivary secretion and all of that. But just so you guys can, uh, to help you memorize it here, parasympathetic does, does more than sympathetic does. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Um, you guys, is, um, can we take a break until seven? Will that work for everyone? Can we have it a little bit more if you don't mind? Uh, I don't mind. You don't think like, 13 minutes is okay. Do you want to like 7.05? How is that? Because I want us to finish uh, as early as possible. Uh, this lecture took longer than I thought it would, honestly. Um, okay. I don't want to. Um, so do you guys, are you guys all back? Do you want to continue with the next lecture? I mean, the sooner we start, the sooner you guys can like leave. <laughs> and uh, we were supposed to be done by seven, but I think at the first lecture is a bit, it takes a while to explain, so I'm not entirely surprised. Okay, so uh, should 
Should I wait for more yeses? Is anyone else here that hasn't typed in the chat, just so I know? Because I don't want everyone else to, to miss it. OK, I think we'll start now, just so we don't waste time. Um, OK, so this second lecture is, um, I think it's much easier compared to the first one. Um, it's just mainly, so we talked about what happens when we ingest food, and we mainly focused on saliva. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, chewing and then, so mastication, more, uh, you know, like the fancy term for it is mastication. Uh, how that happens, we're going to talk a little bit about pressure and then the mechanism of swallowing the different phases and uh, you know what would happen if certain things started failing, which is known as pathophysiology and, and the different things that you guys have to know at this stage. Again, all my slides are from Dr. Peter. Uh, I, th I thought it was better to use his slides just so you guys can you know, get used to, to one resource and not have to study more than one thing. So yeah, okay. Uh, so this is a very straightforward slide. Um, it just basically talks about what happens when you chew food. So as you chew food, your mouth close, closes and then your jaw, your lower jaw drops. And as that happens, pressure increases and pressure decreases. So when the mouth closes over the food, which is known as a bolus at this stage, when, mouth closes, when the mouth closes over the food, that will cause pressure to increase. And this is detected by uh, me mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors uh, are usually involved when it comes to things that are not chemical substances. So that would be chemoreceptors. So mechanoreceptors uh, would be the ones that detect this increase in pressure. So mouth closes, pressure increases. And then if your lower jaw drops when you're chewing, that decreases the pressure on the mechanoreceptors. And then this just, this keeps repeating until the, uh, the bolus or the food can be swallowed, okay? Uh, it's pretty straightforward, uh, something we're very familiar with. And um, so mastication is a very important process because it not only helps uh, make it easier to swallow food, but it also breaks it down into several tiny particles. And the reason why this is important is because we still have a whole lot of digestion that's going to be followed, that's going to come after swallowing your food, right? And this digestion, we're, you know, we're helping this digestion by creating a bigger surface area on these food particles. So when we break these food particles down, the, um, the surface area increases, right? So it's a, like it's so many tiny particles, and there's a lot of places where the enzymes can act on these foods and eventually break them down. And then, so this is the main reason of, uh, or the main function of mastication, which is to reduce the particle size. Another thing is to help mix it with saliva. And um, when it comes to uh, the ingestion of, of plants, right, it helps to break down the cellulose that is around it mechanically. So uh, the chewing will, will mechanically break it down. So now we'll talk about the two phases or the two stages of swallowing. So you have a voluntary stage and an involuntary stage. And the voluntary stage is, well, it's voluntary. It's the one that you have control over. You initiate it. And believe it or not, you know everything that happens in this stage because we do it all the time. So what happens is, um, yeah, the burger does look very good. <laughs> I remember this picture like from, from last year. Um, so yeah, it does look very good. Um, so and unfortunately, the bolus of food here does not look as good as the, the burger does. That's because, you know, mastication has already happened and we've, we've chewed it up into tiny little pieces. And now it just, it's represented by this green particle over here. So this green part of the diagram is the bolus of food. So the first thing that happens is your tongue is going to push the bolus of food upwards. And this comes, this bolus of food will then come in contact with this part of your mouth, which is called the heart palate. And you can feel it on the roof of your mouth with your tongue. I think you guys took this in the oral cavity lecture. So it's the hard part of the roof of your mouth. So what happens is when the bolus touches this part, the pressure increases. And this increase in pressure causes the tongue to push back the bolus into your mouth. So into your, to your pharynx, all right? 
And when the bolus moves backward, it also causes an increase in pressure in this area. And this increase in pressure will start the involuntary stage. So the increase in pressure over here by the bolus moving backwards will initiate something known as pharyngeal peristalsis. Okay. Does everyone know what peristalsis means? Just quick yeses or noes, guys, in the chat, please. Exactly. So contraction to move the food down. Um, but it's a very special kind of contraction, right? So you have a, a part of it that's contracting and then a part that's going to be relaxing to allow the food to pass. Okay, so you're exactly right. So pharyngeal peristalsis will start over here in the involuntary stage. Okay, now I want you guys to tell me what's the difference? Do you guys see the space over here? Okay, and here the space is gone, right? Why do you think it's important that we get rid of the space when we're swallowing food? Does anyone know? Uh, to pretend uh, to pre prevent uh, the food from entering the lungs. Okay. Yes. So it's to avoid the food going up into the nasal pharynx. Oh uh, wait, wait. Which one are you talking about? The so one here, the, the below, yeah. or like uh... the one above? We'll talk about the one below in a, in a bit. But the one above, uh, it's so everyone in in the chat, you guys are correct. It's closing this gap that we can see over here to prevent the food from going up into the nasopharynx when we're swallowing it, or the bolus. Yeah, correct. Okay, so uh, that's the first thing that happens. The other thing that happens is as the bolus moves down, the epiglottis, which is this brown flap over here, will close over the trachea. So as you can see, there's a gap over here, and here the gap is no longer there. And this is very important because if this gap is open, there is a possibility that the bolus can enter the trachea. And that leads to something known as pulmonary aspiration, when the food enters your trachea and enters your lungs, and you don't want that, right? So it's important that you have the epiglottis here. So there are two kind of like, um, two boundaries for when food is, is passing down into the esophagus. One is the soft palate, which we said will be pushed upwards, to block the food from going into the nasopharynx. This is also known as nasal regurgitation. So nasal because of the, the location and regurgitation is when something you know, moves backwards or in the reverse direction. So to prevent nasal regurgitation. And then the other thing is the epiglottis being pushed down to prevent what we said is pulmonary aspiration, which is the movement of the bolus into the trachea. So this is exactly what we just talked about. Um, so having said all of that, right, we said that this is going to be blocked, right? And we said that this is going to be blocked. So the uh, nasopharynx, the entry into the nasopharynx is blocked and the entry into the trachea is also blocked. So based on this, do you guys think that we would be able to breathe while we swallow food or swallow the bolus? Exactly, no. We won't be able to do that, okay? And that's that's a good thing because in that way, we prevent the food from going into the wrong, uh, the wrong direction. So when we swallow, respiration is inhibited for these two obvious reasons that we, we saw, the soft palate and the epiglottis. Okay, so we said that when the bolus moves backwards into the pharynx, it initiates pharyngeal peristalsis, right? Which you guys perfectly explained. It's the uh, sequential like contraction relaxation within the pharynx to push the food or the bolus downwards. So what this does is this pharyngeal peristalsis is extremely important at this stage because it will initiate something else. This pharyngeal peristalsis will initiate esophageal peristalsis, which is basically peristalsis in the esophagus and it does this, the first step that it does this is by opening what we know as the upper esophageal sphincter. So it's the sphincter at the top of the esophagus. Usually it's closed, but what happens is when you have pharyngeal peristalsis, it causes the sphincter to open, okay? So I will refer to this as UES from now on, just because it's, it's a really long word. Um, 
So this is the upper esophageal sphincter and it opens due to pharyngeal peristalsis. Um, this is an important point because we will come back to it in the other slides. So just keep this in mind. Okay, our first checkpoint for this lecture. Do we understand everything so far? Okay, and don't worry if you don't, a lot of these concepts are repeated in the other slides, um, so we can go over them again. Okay, now we talked about the UES, or again, the upper esophageal sphincter. And this is basically where it's uh, located. So it's made up of these two muscles. You have the cricopharyngeus muscle, which is this one over here, and you have the inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscle. And these two muscles basically make up the UES, and because of these two muscles, it's a zone of high pressure, okay? So the UES has, has a high pressure. So what happens is you can see this over here. So at rest, the pressure isn't at zero. The pressure is still above zero and it's because of these two muscles. Um, and what happens is when we swallow, we said we have pharyngeal peristalsis, right? And pharyngeal peristalsis will cause opening of the sphincter. So when the pressure drops, this is when the sphincter is opening, okay? So sphincter opens, pressure drops, okay? So if this means, if this drop in pressure means that the sphincter is opening, what do you guys think is happening here when the pressure is increasing? What state is the sphincter in? Is it open or is it closed? Or is it relaxed or constricted? Perfect, it's closed. So uh, that's why we have a spike in pressure, okay? And that's exactly what you see here. So this is just showing you the activity of the muscle. Uh, IPC stands for the inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscle and CP is for cricopharyngeus. So this is at rest. So there's still some activity at rest and that's very important to, to note. Uh, we'll get to why later on, but there's still some activity in the muscle. So it's not completely relaxed at rest. And then if these spikes tell you that the muscle is contracting, if there are no spikes, that would mean that the muscle is contracted or relaxed. Relaxed, okay. And that's exactly what we, we see here when the pressure drops. So the pressure is dropping because the muscle is relaxed. So these are all happening at the same time. So pressure drops because the muscle is relaxed and that means that the sphincter is opening, which we need at this point to pass, to allow the bolus to pass through. Now, as soon as the bolus passes through, we need to start peristalsis, right? So the bolus already passed through the relaxed part of the esophagus. Now we need to have contraction to push the bolus down. And this is exactly why we have this increase in pressure because the upper esophageal sphincter muscles are contracting to push the food down into the esophagus. Does that make sense? Nice. So we said over here at rest and also here, there is still some activity in the muscle. So the muscle is not completely relaxed at rest. There is still, still some contraction that's taking place. And this is due to something known as the vagal tone. So even at rest, there is always going to be a, this continuous stimulation by the vagus nerve, which is going, going to continuously like discharge these signals to these two muscles, okay? which ensures that even when they're rest, when, even when they are at rest, there is still some, um, it's still closed. So there's still uh, some tone to it and it's not completely relaxed, which is why at rest, the pressure isn't at zero. It's because of this vagal tone. So it maintains the closure of the upper esophageal sphincter and makes sure that it remains closed uh, when, you know, when we're not using it or when it's at rest or when we're at rest, okay? so. If the vagal tone is what causes upper esophageal sphincter to be closed, right, in order to open it when we have pharyngeal peristalsis and to open the upper esophageal sphincter when we want to pass the bolus into the esophagus, in order to open the UES, we would obviously have to remove the vagal tone. Okay, because the vagal tone is causing it to be closed. So if we remove the vagal tone, it will open the upper esophageal sphincter. So uh, 
this is uh, basically a device called a manometry. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, but what it does, it's, it's basically a tube that's inserted into your esophagus. And it has a particular like pressure sensors. So it has parts of the tube that detect either an increase or a decrease in pressure. So let's say that this is one of those sensors, right? If you have contraction that occurs close to the sensor, pressure increases. Whereas if you have relaxation that occurs close to the sensor, the pressure will decrease. And this is what the uh, device is detecting. It's detecting this increase and decrease in pressure. And this uh, basically, if you will, could be evidence of peristalsis taking place. So it shows you that there is both contraction, relaxation happening sequentially to push the food down. Um, that's basically, you don't have to know much about this. Uh, I think it's, it's mainly just to help you understand the idea of peristalsis um, and how it's, it's uh, and how the pressure is uh, measured basically through the, the manometry, which is a tube. Okay, uh, I'm sure you've probably heard of, uh, you've been taught this in your, in your lectures in GIT, um, and it's something known as the uh, barium swallow. So it's a fluid that, um, well, you would give to your patient, right? Uh, in order for them to drink and you can like visualize the esophagus. And this is mainly to um, diagnose specific gastrointestinal like diseases um, such as, or actually, do you guys know what this could be used for? Let's see if you guys uh, know, because there's one very, very common example that you would use barium to uh, diagnose it's something you guys took before in GIT. Oh, I think, or hopefully you did. Well, it's it's called Barrett's esophagus. Did you guys take that? Okay. So um, do you guys remember what's characteristic about Barrett's esophagus? Like, what do you see after you do the, uh, after you do the barium? There, it, it looks like it looks like a specific shape. No one remembers. Okay, so um, it basically looks like this. I added this picture so you guys can remember it because it's very high yield. Uh, it it could come in your exam. I'm not going to say that it is. I have no idea what happens, but um, it looks like a bird's beak. Do you guys see it? It looks like a bird here, and then there's like a little beak. Okay, and this is your esophagus. Okay, and this is one of the, uh, Barrett's esophagus is one of those things that we use barium to diagnose. Okay, so, uh, okay, we talked about esophageal peristalsis. Now let's talk about uh, more about the muscles that, that can cause this, right, that lead to peristalsis. So the esophagus can be divided into, well, mainly two parts, but, uh, there is a middle part that we're going to talk about. So the upper part of the esophagus is mainly made out of skeletal muscle, whereas the lower part is made up of smooth muscle. Now in the middle, in the middle you have the transition zone, which is a mix of both, so skeletal and smooth muscle. But it's important to remember that the upper part is skeletal and the lower part is smooth. Now, even though they're two different muscles, right, peristalsis and the contractions are uh, all coordinated by the vagus nerve. Okay, so it's all vagus fibers. Uh, even though it's skeletal and here it's smooth, vagal fibers are, are involved in both. Okay. So, uh, yeah, well, I have a question for you guys. Okay. If this is striated muscle, would this mean that this is the upper or lower part of the esophagus? Upper. Exactly. You're right. Okay. So striated muscle uh, would be your skeletal muscle that we talked about over here. So another, if you guys didn't know, striated muscle, skeletal muscle, same thing. Um, so this would be upper esophagus, which makes smooth muscle the, this would be what part, the lower esophagus. Perfect, okay. So, uh, all right. So we said that in order to stimulate contraction or in order to stimulate peristalsis, in both the upper and the lower part of the esophagus, vagal fibers are involved in both. And this is exactly what you can see here. You see vagal fibers over here and vagal fibers over here. Okay. 
So all of this uh, stimulation is coming from the swallowing center. That's always what we're going to go back to, the swallowing center. Now, when it comes to the upper part of the esophagus, um, stimulation mainly comes from a structure known as the nucleus ambiguous. Okay. Now, this nucleus ambiguous um, will send its signals through the vagal fibers. Okay, and these vagal fibers will have direct contact. This is very important. Will have a direct contact with the striated muscle or the skeletal muscle in the upper part of the esophagus. Okay, and through the release of acetylcholine, it will cause contraction. That's that's the entire story here. Um, but it's very important to remember one: uh, the nucleus ambiguous. That's where the uh, somatic motor neurons come from. Vagal fibers are involved, and there is direct contact with the striated muscle, um, and the release of acetylcholine causes a contraction. Now, in the lower part of the esophagus, like you guys correctly identified, where we have smooth muscle, the signals come from the dorsal motor nucleus. Now, this is pure memorization. You guys, I'm sorry, I can't make it easier for you, uh, but this is the dorsal motor nucleus. Again, you also have vagal fibers, but the difference is there is no direct contact here with the vagal fibers to the smooth muscle in the lower part of the esophagus. Because as you can see, we have these two little neurons that aren't in the upper part of the esophagus. And these two neurons are called um, myenteric neurons, okay? And they can either be inhibitory or they can be excitatory. And if they're inhibitory, they cause relaxation. And if they are excitatory, then they cause contraction. And it all depends on the uh, substances that it will release. So if something, if this neuron is inhibitory, it's because it releases nitric oxide and VIP, which stands for vasoactive intestinal peptide. And these two uh, will cause relaxation of the muscle. Okay. Whereas for the excitatory neurons, because it releases acetylcholine and substance P, it will cause contraction of the smooth muscle. Now, why, why is this important? Why am I taking so like such, such a long time to point it out is this difference where here in the upper part, there is direct contact with the, uh, with the striated muscle and the lower esophagus, you have these myenteric neurons that are kind of like the middle man, okay? And this is really important when it comes to uh, understanding the way that these neurons are stimulated in order to bring about peristalsis because we said peristalsis is not um, a regular type of contraction, right? It's not just like, okay, we're contracting and that's it. Peristalsis is sequential contraction and relaxation, then contraction, relaxation until the bolus is passed down into the stomach through the esophagus. So the reason why this is important is because let's say, okay, I don't, I don't, this, I don't want this to freak you out, guys. Um, these lines freaked me out last year, but um, I'm gonna be very honest. This is the first time I actually understood them like perfectly. So um, we'll, we'll go through them together. So this is the esophagus, okay? This is the upper part of the esophagus where you have striated muscle. And then you have the lower part of the esophagus where you have smooth muscle. Now, because over here, there is in the upper part of the esophagus, there is direct contact, right? Direct contact with the striated muscle. So this means, let's say, if we were to stimulate these vagal fibers all at once, okay, all of the vagal fibers that um, stimulate the upper esophagus, if we sent signals through them all at once, then the entire upper esophagus would contract simultaneously. So it would contract together, right? And that's not peristalsis, right? That's not what we talked about, right? Um, however, when it comes to the lower part of the esophagus, if we stimulated all of these vagal fibers at the same time, you would not have contraction of all of the muscles in the lower part of the esophagus or the entire smooth muscle of the esophagus. And why is that? Okay, it's because of the myenteric neurons. So even though the vagal fibers are being stimulated all at once, these excitatory and the inhibitory neurons can coordinate between contraction and relaxation, bringing about peristalsis, okay? So again, if we were to stimulate all these neurons at once, because of the direct contact with the striated muscle, they would all contract at the same time, the striated muscle. 
However, in the lower esophagus, because of the myenteric neurons, we can stimulate these vagal fibers all at once uh, because of the coordination between them. So because of the coordination between the release of acetylcholine substance P, vasoactive intestinal peptide, and nitric oxide, um, there would still be peristalsis because peristalsis in the lower esophagus is reliant on these two neurons, the myenteric ones. Does that make sense? I feel like I haven't checked in on you guys in a while. <laughs> it's just, it's a topic that I, I wanted to make sure you guys understood. Okay, perfect. So now we can't, um, we can't just have the upper part of the esophagus contract all at once, right? Because that, that wouldn't help with you know, our goal of peristalsis, right? So we need to make sure that there's, there's a way in which the upper part of the esophagus can also have peristalsis where the muscles contract one by one. So this part contracts, then this part contracts, and then this one contracts. And instead of, of um, stimulating these vagal fibers all at once, okay, we are gonna have to activate the neurons sequentially. And this is for the upper part of the esophagus, which means let's say we have these three neurons attached to the striated muscle, okay? Now we have to stimulate the first one on its own, then stimulate the second one, and then stimulate the third one instead of stimulating all of them at once, okay? And this is because of the direct contact. Whereas in the smooth muscle, it doesn't matter. You can stimulate the vagal fibers all at once, but we still have peristalsis, because of these two neurons over here, the inhibitory and the excitatory neurons. So this is an important differentiation like to, to make. In the upper part of the esophagus, peristalsis is dependent on the sequential, so sequential meaning one after another, activation of the neurons. Whereas in the lower part of the esophagus, it's dependent on the coordination between the excitatory and the inhibitory neurons and the release of um, the substances that will cause contraction and those that will cause relaxation. Okay, one more time. Did that make sense? And I can come back to it at the end of the, the lecture if, if anyone doesn't understand. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, okay, so this is basically what we've been talking about this whole time. Uh, this is the... Um, this is the coordination between the excitatory and the inhibitory neurons that happens in this part of the esophagus. So acetylcholine and substance P causing contraction. So it will push the bolus over here where you have relaxation by the vasoactive and the, um, the vasoactive intestinal peptide and the nitric oxide that will cause this relaxation. And um, so this is very important. So peristalsis in the smooth muscle part, which is the lower part of the esophagus, it is solely due to the coordination between proximal excitatory neurons and distal inhibitory neurons. So proximal, because you want it to be before the bolus, right? So it can contract and push the bolus downwards. And then you would have distal relaxation to make space for that bolus to enter. And then that just continues until the bolus is eventually in the stomach. Checkpoint. Are we all good? I understood the concept, but not the lines. Okay, so the concept is, so the lines are there uh, to help you understand the concept. So if you understand the concept, you're good, but um, I can come back to it at the end and explain the lines to you again. Uh, but I wouldn't say that the lines are like, you know, they're not like a make it or break it kind of thing. Like you don't really have to, to understand the lines. It's just mainly the concept, uh, but I can come back to it later on. Can you please explain the last slide? This one? Okay, so remember when we talked about uh, these two neurons, the inhibitory ones and the excitatory ones? Okay, so excitatory um, will cause contraction. And that's because they release uh, acetylcholine and they release substance P, which is what you see here. So the excitatory neurons, picture them over here, they release acetylcholine, they release substance P, and this will cause contraction at this part of the esophagus. Okay. However, these inhibitory neurons are going to be at a distal part. So they're going to be uh, released after 
or right after the bolus in order for this part of the esophagus to relax and make space for that bolus that is being pushed downwards. Okay, so let's, let's say if we had contraction over here and the bolus was over here, the bolus of food wouldn't be able to pass, which is why you need to have contraction before the bolus and relaxation after it to kind of like pave the way. Does that make sense? Okay, no problem. So this is just basically how uh, peristalsis occurs in the lower part of the esophagus, okay? Um, and if you're worried about uh, these two uh, terms over here, this just basically means that this is where your, uh, your mouth would be, and then this is where the end of the gastrointestinal tract would be. So here's your mouth, and let's say here's the stomach, right? And the bolus is going to go this way. Okay. So, okay, so I don't know if you guys remember. Um, but we said that the, so this is just a summary of the two sphincters that, uh, or the UES, which we talked about, LES, which we will talk about uh, in a bit, the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, do you guys remember how uh, we cause relaxation of the upper esophageal sphincter? It's removal of something. Yeah, perfect, vagal tone. Okay, I don't know if you guys already studied the lecture or if you know it because I did such a good job, but I'm, I'm gonna hope it's, it's maybe it's both, okay. Um, so you're absolutely right. It's the removal of the vagal tone. Um, that's how we have relaxation of the upper esophageal sphincter. Thank you, I appreciate that. It's my first call session, so that means a lot. Okay, so upper esophageal sphincter um, relaxes because we remove the vagal tone, okay? And that's exactly what you see here. We explain this in the third slide maybe, where the pressure decreases and the sphincter, sphincter opens, right? So uh, these lines uh, are basically showing you that the esophagus, different parts of the esophagus, like this part contracts, and then this part contracts, and then this part contracts, and then finally this part contracts. And this happens one after the other, which is basically what peristalsis means. So this first line over here, signifies contraction of this part of the esophagus. And then as you can see, if you go down, the second part of the esophagus doesn't contract at the same time, right? It contracts some time after it. And that is basically um, kind of showing you peristalsis in uh, these like weird pressure line forms. Um, okay, so we talked a lot about the UES. Uh, let's talk about the lower esophageal sphincter, which is at the bottom of the esophagus. So this is basically the gateway into the stomach, right? So this is the last part that the food has to pass through in order to enter the stomach. And um, what happens is the lower esophageal sphincter actually relaxes before the food or before the bolus gets to it. So let's say, um, let me try and bring out a pen. Actually, I think I have a, yeah, okay, I got a, a I got a GIF for you guys. I'm not going to say GIF, even though it's controversial, controversial but um, this is a GIF that shows you uh, the movement of the bolus, okay? And if you pay attention to this part, which is the lower esophageal sphincter, you can see that it opens before the bolus actually gets to it. Can you guys see that? Yeah, okay. So, um, so the lower esophageal sphincter, we can agree, will relax like we just saw before the bolus um, gets to it. And the way that it relaxes is due to, well, you guys tell me, do you think relaxation will be caused by uh, acetylcholine and substance P or nitric oxide and VIP? Perfect, exactly. So nitric oxide and VIP is what's going to cause this relaxation. And um, will these come, what type of neurons will these come from, excitatory or inhibitory? Inhibitory, yeah. Okay, um, perfect. So you guys get it. Okay, so this is um, known uh, as something, something known as the vagal, vagal reflex here in the lower uh, esophageal sphincter. So what happens is you have uh, 
uh, afferent fibers in the pharynx, okay? And these afferent fibers in the pharynx, once our peristalsis begins, it will detect this and will send signals that will come back in the form of afferent neurons to the lower esophageal sphincter, releasing the two things that you guys just mentioned, nitric oxide and VIP, causing relaxation. So that's basically what's, what they mean by vagal vagal reflex is you have neurons in the pharynx, which is the afferent neurons that detect this peristalsis, and then they will send signals back to the uh, lower esophageal sphincter through efferent neurons, causing relaxation by nitric oxide and VIP. And this is, again, this is the barium swallow. Um, and another point that is um, a bit important is the fact that you guys see this is the fluid, right? It's entering through the esophagus and it's only going down. So there's no remnants. Like you guys don't see any uh, fluid remaining, right? There's nothing uh, being left behind. And that's important to note because that shows you that the esophagus, uh, the only function of the esophagus is transport. Okay, so the main thing that it does is it transports the bolus from the oral cavity into the stomach. It has absolutely no storage function whatsoever. It's not supposed to store, store anything within the esophagus. Um, and this is something that you can also see through the barium swallow. Okay, and we looked at this again, lower esophageal sphincter opens uh, before the bolus reaches to it. And this is due to the vagal vagal uh, ref reflex that we talked about. Does everyone understand that point? Okay. Cool. Uh, okay. So we come to a very, this is one of the most interesting concepts for me, strangely, in GIT was secondary peristalsis. And it sounds very uh, basic, but um, it's, it's really interesting to see how the body has so many mechanisms to um, protect you from things. And this is one of them. So um, secondary peristalsis, remember how we said um, when we have esophageal peristalsis, it's initiated by something. Do you guys remember what initiates the esophageal peristalsis? Well, you're right, vagal tone opens the sphincter. So removal of the vagal tone will cause opening of the sphincter. But we mentioned something um, that happens in the pharynx. And when this happens, that will cause uh, esophageal peristalsis as well. It's okay if you guys don't remember it. We kind of, uh, I didn't spend too much time on it, uh, but I told you guys to keep it in mind, uh, which was this over here. So if this, okay, so pharyngeal peristalsis is what causes the esophageal phase to begin. Okay, and this is important to keep in mind. Um, so when you, when you swallow the bolus, right, you have pharyngeal peristalsis, like we talked about, and that will start esophageal peristalsis. And the reason why I bring this up now is because in secondary peristalsis, that doesn't happen. Okay. In secondary peristalsis, the esophageal peristalsis just happens on its own. It doesn't happen, or it's, it's independent of the pharyngeal contraction. Okay, so it doesn't wait for pharyngeal peristalsis to occur in order for it to happen. It can just happen on its own. Okay, and the main reason that this happens is to clear the esophagus. Now, like we said, the esophagus isn't supposed to store anything, right? It's just supposed to be a means of transport of the bolus into the stomach. So if there's any residual material in the esophagus, our first instinct would be to get rid of it. And this is why our esophagus is capable of initiating this secondary peristalsis on its own, which is to clear the esophagus. Does that part make sense? Do you guys understand the difference between secondary peristalsis and just uh, normal esophageal peristalsis after swallowing? Okay. So that's the first concept. Another concept that we have is something known as deglutitive inhibition. Now, um, uh, deglutitive inhibition uh, is the best example that I can think of is when you're chugging uh, like a large, like you're chugging a lot of water. 
uh, let's say you have this large glass of water and you're taking uh, like you're you're swallowing a lot like one after the other you know you're not taking breaks in between um, so these are what are known as your multiple swallows and there's approximately one second between each and that's just to tell you that it's happening uh, sequentially really fast one after the other so what happens is when um, when you're when you're when you have multiple swallows following one another this will cause a disconnection between the pharyngeal and the esophageal phases. Again, remember how we said it, pharyngeal peristalsis initiates esophageal peristalsis. But what happens is when you swallow a lot one after the other, uh, this connection becomes uh, disconnected. So pharyngeal peristalsis no longer initiates esophageal peristalsis. So what happens is the esophagus remains relaxed and it remains in other words, I guess you could say uh, peristalsis is no longer occurring in the esophagus, okay? Um, so it's inhibited. And another thing is that the lower esophageal sphincter relaxation is prolonged, which means it's open for longer, okay? And that basically allows um, whatever you're taking in to just easily pass through the esophagus and into the stomach. Okay, now this continues to happen. So esophageal peristalsis is inhibited until it comes to the last swallow. So when you take in that last sip of water, right, um, that's when esophageal peristalsis will occur. So it's been inhibited for the entire process, right, until you take the last swallow of water, for example, and then esophageal peristalsis will occur to finally just kind of like clear the esophagus, right? Um, and then another thing, we said that the lower esophageal uh, sphincter relaxation is prolonged, but after the last swallow, when peristalsis um, picks up again in the esophagus, then the lower esophageal sphincter, the tone will return to it. So it's no longer uh, relaxed. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so you can see this here, okay? Um, you can see this here. So deglutitive inhibition. So when you have multiple swallows, esophageal peristalsis is, is inhibited, and the lower esophageal relaxation, uh, relax, the lower esophageal sphincter relaxation is prolonged. And you can see this over here. So this is uh, this drop in pressure, right? It shows you that it's taking place over a longer period of time. And this is uh, basically what's being said here uh, in a diagram. Um, okay, can you guys tell me what this is? What, 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 what is this called? We just went over it. And I Barrett's even esophagus? Barrett's esophagus, yeah. And, and the, um, what's the, oh, this is, uh, okay, so it does look similar, uh, but this is actually something, uh, something known as uh, achalasia. And, um, but I was mostly uh, asking about what is used to diagnose it. Like, what's this fluid called that we just- Barium sulfate. The, the barium, right? Yeah, okay, so, so barium swallow. Um, so this is exactly what we see here and what we were talking about in the, uh, the previous uh, slides. So when it comes to um, achalasia, uh, what happens in achalasia is Remember the inhibitory neurons that we talked about? So this over here, this is the lower esophageal sphincter. So we said that we have inhibitory neurons that will cause relaxation of the LES for it to open, okay? But in some people, um, these inhibitory neurons are destroyed, okay? And if these inhibitory neurons are destroyed, this is what the lower esophageal sphincter will look like. It will be extremely constricted. Um, and this is what you can see here. So it's so constricted to the point where, you know, even the fluid can't pass through it. And th that's what you can see. And this is because the inhibitory neurons that release our VIP and nitric oxide are destroyed. And what happens over time is that the excitatory neurons that cause contraction are also destroyed. Okay, and this happens um, after the inhibitory neurons, uh, after destruction of the inhibitory neurons. So what does this, what does this mean for us, right? So this would mean that anything that we ingest wouldn't be able to pass. It wouldn't be able to pass uh, out of the esophagus and into the stomach, which means that it would accumulate, right? And if something accumulates in the esophagus, 
what do you think would happen to the esophagus, like shape-wise? It, it's it literally says it here, but try not to <laughs> try not to look. It would dilate, yeah, exactly, because of the accumulation. And that's exactly what you can also see here. So because of the accumulation and the, cons the constriction of the LES, um, whatever you just ingested wouldn't be able to enter the stomach. So it stays here. Um, so this is exactly what it says here. So the LES fails to relax after you swallow and the esophagus will dilate. And then uh, over time, because of this dilation, you'll start to have weak peristalsis in the lower part of the esophagus. Um, and this can be caused by autoimmune diseases, or it could be viral that causes um, the achalasia. Uh, but anything that causes, uh, so it's progressive dysfunction of the enteric nervous system. So it's, um, so you don't really know, it could be autoimmune, it could be a virus, it could be anything like that. But does, does the, uh, do you guys understand why this happens? Why the lower esophageal sphincter looks like this? Okay, so um, now we talked about what happens when the lower esophageal sphincter is constricted, when it's completely closed. But can you guys tell me what would happen, let's say if we had a weak lower esophageal sphincter, if it was open all the time, what do you think would, that would lead to? Perfect, acid reflux. Okay, so this is exactly what we're gonna talk about next. Um, another uh, fancy name for gastric reflux, which we also know as, as heartburn, is uh, gastroesophageal reflux, okay? And in order to prevent this from happening, in order to prevent acid reflux from happening, we need to make sure that the, even at rest, we need to make sure that the pressure in the LES is still high, okay? Because if pressure drops, then fluid from the stomach could enter the esophagus, and we don't want that to happen. That's not supposed to happen. And that doesn't happen because we have a high resting pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter. So this, um, this line over here is the lower esophageal sphincter and this Y axis uh, determines the pressure, okay? So lower esophageal sphincter has a high resting pressure um, even at rest, preventing uh, gastric secretions from entering the esophagus. Um, okay. So let's say um, we have a change in this pressure, okay? Um, let's say the lower esophageal sphincter decreased, okay? If the pressure in the stomach was higher than the pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter, where do you guys think the fluid would move? Because fluid moves from a high pressure to low pressure environment, right? So the fluid would move to the esophagus, right? Which is why we need to make sure that the pressure in the LES is always above the pressure in the stomach, okay? So when do we actually get gastroesophageal reflux? We get this when either one of two things. So either the pressure in the stomach increases higher than the pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter, or the lower esophageal sphincter decreases below the pressure of the stomach. But in the same, in both cases, the pressure in the stomach has to be higher than the pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter. And that's exactly what we see here. So this is the pressure of the stomach. If it increases above the LES pressure, then we would have acid reflux. If the LES pressure decreases below the pressure of the stomach, then we would also have acid reflux because the secretions or the fluid is going to move from a high to low pressure area. Does that make sense? Um, okay, and that's actually how, um, you know, so vomiting, that's how vomiting occurs when we have regurgitation, and I'm sure you guys are going to take this in, in, in your physiology lectures, not sure if you did yet, but because of the rise in the intra-abdominal pressure, we are able to regurgitate um, uh, what, you know, whatever is in our stomach, okay, that's how we're able to vomit, because we increase the intra-abdominal pressure above the pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter so we can push through it and then that causes regurgitation. Okay, so um, remember when we talked about the two muscles of the UES, we said it was the cricopharyngeus and the inferior uh, pharyngeal constrictor muscle. 
So now we're going to talk about the muscles of the lower esophageal sphincter. And um, as you can see, it's not as special as the upper esophageal sphincter. So the UES has two specific muscles that are unique for, it, for, them, for itself, you know? Whereas the LES, it's kind of like borrowing muscles from its environment, right? It's getting muscles from, like it's using the muscles of the diaphragm and it's also using like the smooth muscle in the lower part of the esophagus, right? So it's just things that happen to be around the lower esophageal sphinc sphincter that are helping it contract and, you know, um, contract and relax and carry out its job and function as a sphincter. And, um, this is, this is important because uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but or if someone, if any of the doctors have, have mentioned this, but the upper esophageal sphincter is usually known as like a functional sphincter, whereas the lower one is known more as a physiological one. And it's because of, of uh, these muscles and the anatomy of it, basically. Um, so here, like I said, we have the smooth muscle of the esophagus. So it's kind of like, as you can see, it's like a thickening of it. Um, and then we also have the diaphragm. Or the costal or the cruel, sorry, part of the diaphragm, uh, which is this part over here that uh, contributes to the lower esophageal sphincter. So, um, and they're both equally important. So, one is not more important than the other. The diaphragm contributes just as much as the smooth muscle in the lower part of the esophagus does. And this is shown to you over here. So, in people that have uh, esophageal myotomy, which is removal of the muscle in the esophagus. So, let's say we got rid of this bulk of muscle over here, then the lower esophageal sphincter would lose 50% of its uh, contractile function, okay? So normally, without the esophageal, esophageal myotomy, let's say you have both muscles present, um, the pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter is about 30. But let's say we did remove the uh, muscles in the es esophagus for that part of the lower esophageal sphincter, then it drops from 30 to 15, which is half of what it was. And that shows you that the crural diaphragm um, and this part of the sphincter, which is the, uh, which is the uh, muscles within the esophagus, right? These two parts uh, contribute just as much, like it's a 50-50 kind of thing, okay? And that's the entire uh, concept of this slide. Okay, uh, this is just repeating what we already discussed. Um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as uh, this GERD or GERD, however you want to pronounce it. Um, so we said that either the person could have a, uh, a low, uh, lower esophageal sphincter pressure, okay, which will cause fluid to move upwards or the pressure in the stomach could rise above that of the LES and eventually the fluid would just push through it, okay? Now, okay, I don't want you guys to look at this, but um, I have a question, okay? And this could be our final question, I think. Um, but okay, let's say I have acid reflux or a person has acid reflux. What do you think from what we discussed could be a mechanism in which the body or the esophagus can help us, uh, can protect ourselves against these, uh, against this acid reflux or against the acid from damaging our esophagus. What's one thing we mentioned that clears the esophagus that could help in case of acid reflux? Secondary peristalsis. Um, I mean, vomiting, um, well, in this case, your main, uh, main goal would be to get rid of the acid, right? And you want to return it back into the stomach. You want to clear the esophagus. So mainly for gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, secondary esophageal peristalsis can help clear, uh, can help clear the uh, esophagus, okay? Now, another thing, which we mentioned a lot in the first lecture, is the bicarbonate. Right? Do you guys remember the bicarbonate that uh, is contained within the saliva and the alkalinity of the saliva? So this would be very beneficial here because we have acid, right? We're trying to neutralize the acid, exactly. So um, this bicarbonate causes acid neutralization. So it's these two things uh, that we discussed that help uh, defend against injury when you have acid reflux. Okay. Does everything make sense so far before I explain this last slide? Okay, so uh, 
Okay, so this is, uh, as you can see, the title is very dramatic. It's a vicious cycle, and it really, really is. And we'll talk about why uh, in, a, in a bit. So first of all, let's say we're dealing with a person that has a reflux of hydrochloric acid and pepsin. In other words, reflux of the gastric secretions uh, into, the, into the esophagus. And we said that this occurs due to two reasons, right? Either the stomach pressure increases, either the lower esophageal sphincter decreases. Okay, so now this person has acid reflux. Okay, now this acid, because it's it's entering the esophagus and it's not meant to be there, and um, acid and pepsin, they're 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 strong substances, right? So they're going to cause uh, injury to the mucosal membranes of the esophagus. Okay, and yes, we do have the alkalinity alkalinity of the saliva that can neutralize this acid, and we do have secondary peristalsis. But if we continuously have reflux after reflux, and more of the mucosa is being injured, then these defense mechanisms they can only do so much, right? They're going to start to uh, decrease. Now, this mucosal injury over time will lead to inflammation within the esophagus. So. The more injury you get, that will lead to eventually esophageal uh, inflammation. Now, when something is inflamed, it obviously loses some of its function, right? So you'd have decreased peristalsis. And because you have decreased peristalsis, more acid and more pepsin, more gastric secretions can enter the esophagus. And that's why you'll have more mucosal injury. And then that will lead to more inflammation. And then the more inflammation, less function, so decreased peristalsis, and this cycle just keeps on going and going and going. Now, because we have inflammation, that can also cause reducing the pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter, okay? And when the pressure in the sphincter is reduced, eventually it just becomes weak, okay? The sphincter becomes, it becomes weak. It's no longer um, you know, constricted as much as it's supposed to be uh, at times where you know, we don't need it to be open. So you start to have a weak lower esophageal sphincter. And when this esophageal sphincter is weak and the pressure is low, we talked about it. We said that this is going to cause reflux. So that's why it's, it's a vicious cycle because you know, it's, it just, it's ongoing and it never ends. Um, and this is something that over time can lead to uh, the uh, varus esophagus, which is gonna be metaplasia where the epithelium in the esophagus changes, okay? Because of the, uh, the chronic exposure to the uh, acid and the pepsin. Does that make sense? This is my last slide. If you guys have any questions about this, let me know. All good? Okay, so um, yeah, that's it. Um, we finished two lectures in three hours. Uh, but I think as long as you guys benefited, then I'm really, really happy. Uh, I also listed some uh, GIT physiology resources for you guys. These are my personal top three, my favorites, uh, Guyton, uh, USMLE, and uh, 13th Batch. They have amazing, um, physiology practice questions that they've compiled from like several resources. Uh, so I found those to be really beneficial, not only for physiology, but all the all the other disciplines as well. So anatomy too. And then again, uh, you can text me over WhatsApp, email me, and I'll be happy to help anytime. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you guys have any questions, I will answer to the best of my ability. I'm so happy you guys benefited. I really, really am. And thank you guys. I know it took a long time, but um, I'm glad you guys stuck around.